Uh, this is design strategies and advanced data visualization. Um, if you were expecting the session that was going to be here yesterday, now would be a good time to um, leave because I'm definitely not going to talk about database migrations to Azure and other things like that, which were going to be in this room previously. So um, I hope you're all in the right session. Um, this session is part of the data visualization and storytelling learning pathway. How many of you were in the session yesterday, Prathi's first session? Ah, oh, quite, a, quite a few. Cool, thank you for coming to this. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. I thought it was a great session. Well done, Prathi. Um, and uh, her and I will be, this is obviously session number two, and Prathi and I tomorrow, we'll be going through data storytelling and we'll be building a bunch of data stories for you live in the session, or maybe not building them live, but at least demonstrating them live, talking through the thought process and working through some of the ideas and how we come to what we do when we, we are building data stories. And uh, it's quite a, we, we have quite a sort of wide variety of, of opinions and thoughts about how things go. So hopefully there's quite a lot there for everyone to ingest. Um, so that's tomorrow morning. Uh, currently it's in Yakima. I think that's how somebody told me to say it, Yakima. Yakima won tomorrow, but that is likely, uh, that is potentially going to change. A couple of sessions got moved around. So um, cool. So we've gone through please cell, cell phones and pass. My name is James McGillivray. Um, I am a BI consultant from Johannesburg, South Africa. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Another South African here. Um, anyone ever been to South Africa? Other than Chris? Couple? Yeah, do you enjoy it? Yeah, it's a lovely, beautiful, beautiful country. And uh, it's a really great place for you guys to visit. Uh, you have this wonderful thing called the dollar. The dollar is very strong against our currency. Um, really, really, it makes, it makes your vacation incredibly affordable. It makes my coming over to this conference incredibly not affordable. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, if you get a chance, it really is, despite the sort of 25 or 26 hours flying from Seattle, it's worth coming to South Africa. It's a beautiful country, lots to do there. So that's my plug for SA. Um, and then obviously, uh, I've been working in Microsoft BI for, for 10 years. I, well, a bit more now, but I started in SSRS 2008. Um, I, I really only started in SSRS because that was the only place I could get a job when I came out of university. I uh, may not have been the best student in the world. Um, I, I spent a lot of time partying, I spent a lot of time socializing and uh, just sort of generally not studying. So when I came out with my comp sci degree, a lot of the, the, the dev houses were like, nope, no, none for you. So I went into data, which was very much considered an unsexy thing to do, but it's worked out amazingly. So, you know, maybe a I got a bit lucky, I think. So anyway, that's me. Outside of cricket, uh, outside, of, <laughs> outside of data, I like playing cricket and football. And um, I guess I have to sort of give an obligatory shout out to South Africa who won the World Cup last weekend. Uh, <laughs> I got up at, at 2 a.m. and we were in Portland for SQL Saturday, Oregon. And I got up at 2 a.m. and really, I haven't recovered ever since. So it was wonderful, but it's also been awful. So anyway, right, let's get started. I'm sure you're sick and tired of me yattering on. Um, please. Remember to fill out your session evaluations. They're really, really important for the speakers. They're really important for past the organization and for the organizers to know what went well, what didn't go so well, uh, who, who did a good job. Hopefully, I'll sort of do an OK job today and uh, teach you what you'd like to know. So what are we going to do today? We're going we're gonna to talk about data visualization, particularly, uh, and, and some techniques, some tips, and some theory about visual, uh, data visualization. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to talk about theory. We're going to learn some design theory. We're going to learn some color theory. We're going to do a bunch of that. After we've learned the theory, I'm going to show you some demos, some Power BI reports, some websites and things uh, where these th these, this theory has been put into practice. Um, and hopefully, we can look at them and try and understand what's, been, what's going well, what's going maybe not so well. And then finally, we're just going to talk very briefly about the benefits and cost of good design or of design strategies and that and how it influences what we can do. Cool. So the session is split up into six parts. We're going to very briefly touch on some general design theory. We're then going to move on and do color. Uh, we're going to talk about color in 
I know Prathi touched on color yesterday. We're going to talk slightly differently today, just one or two other things about color. And then we're going to talk about grid theory and how it can affect our layouts and what we, how we design reports in place elements. And then after that, we're going to talk very briefly about accessible design and why that's important. We're going to touch on... Um, and then we're going to talk about the two different types of design. We're going to talk about designing for data exploration and designing for data explanation. So one where you, you are presenting someone with the ability to explore the data themselves, one where you have found out all the data that you'd like to tell the story of, and how we present it differently. They're two different, slightly different techniques. There's quite a lot of uh, little things that we can talk about there. Cool. So on that note, let's get started. Um, do I have a, oh, I can't see on my screen. That's not good. Did that work? Sorry, I'm going to have to use my mouse because I can't actually see what's going on on those things. Cool. So general design tips and uh, thoughtful design. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about design theory. I've got a blog post that I've written, which I'll share the link with with you at the end of this thing, which has all of these links and much more in-depth articles about, um, about design theory. But design theory really comes down to six elements, and this, or six principles, should I say, and they, they are things we should keep in mind, even if we don't necessarily know exactly what they mean from a real, you know, the desi heavy design theory point of view. So I'm going to touch on those six elements, and then uh, we'll sort of dig into each one or two of them as we go along, okay? The first one is balance. Now, balance is, is fairly simple to do. Basically, you can make a report or any, any data visualization uh, stand out or not, or, or fade into the background or appear more or less important by the way you position it relevant, relative to other elements. Uh, if you make it smaller, obviously something bigger will, uh, will be um, more prominent, will be more important in the, in the visual hierarchy. If you make it lighter, the darker element will be. If you have more color, it will be viewed as more important than something that's kind of full of grays. So your balance is very important in terms of making sure that what you are presenting is what you are trying to present at the same time. So if you've got a visual that's got a load of color in it, but it's the least, in, least important visual on your, on your dashboard, report, PowerPoint, whatever it is, you're probably not going to focus your audience's attention in the way that you want because that color will, will automatically draw the eye and it'll automatically be the thing that they focus on. In terms of, or well, secondly, thing we can, we can think of in the same way is proximity. And, and proximity, Prathi touched on yesterday, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it's a Gestalt principle. Things that are grouped very close together with, with then a, a bigger space to something else will appear as a single group. Things that are put de deliberately far apart will, will seem like separate elements. So you can leverage that in your designs to, to keep the things that, you, that are telling the same story together and something that you want to be slightly different, you can put it somewhere else. It's not the only way we can do it, but proximity and, and the closeness of how we join things together is definitely one of those things. The third thing is alignment, and I'm not going to talk much about alignment now because we're going to get into quite a bit of detail when we go to grid theory. But essentially, anything that is not in line with other, with other elements will always stick out. Now, you can use that to your advantage if you want to. But most of the time, it makes most sense to align all of your elements uh, in a way that, that makes sense. Because if you've got disjointed elements, if you've got things that start halfway through other things, well, not halfway. Halfway is generally in alignment. But if you've got things that slot slightly below and slightly above and you don't have all your elements aligned, you're going to have a very difficult time trying to convince your viewer into which way they should follow the, or how they should consume the report and which way they should follow the, the visual hierarchy. So alignment is very important. And as I say, we're going to go into a bit of detail there. Repetition, also a very important thing. People become, Prathi, Prathi had a slide yesterday, I don't know if you, if you remember it, about the iconic memory, iconic short-term and long-term memory. Now, iconic memory is basically 
what do you see the moment you open something? What, what can you tell from it, okay? And we should always design with that in mind. But repetition is not for iconic memory, it's for short-term memory. You can only keep, on, on average, four chunks of information in your short-term memory at any given time. After, once you start pushing those, the fourth one out and you get another one in there, that is either forgotten altogether or pushed into long-term memory. And similar to a PC, it takes us longer, our brains longer to go in and retrieve something from long-term memory than it does from short-term memory. So if we can have four elements that are telling, that have the same layout, the same style, maybe the same font, color, all of those kinds of things, what that means is we're not overloading our short-term memory with different all kinds of different things going on, and we can store more information in the short-term memory than sort of clutter. So it's a very important thing for us to keep in mind is to, to try and keep things consistent and, this, and, and leverage that. If things are consistent, you will keep them, you will think of them as being consistent. If something is different, show it being differently. Show it different, have a different color, have a different whatever it is. And, and we, we did touch on it yesterday in terms of color. So. Um, a very, very important uh, design element is contrast. And I've, I've already talked about it. Basically, in all of these things that I've talked about so far, I've talked about contrast. Things that look the same, things that act the same, that are aligned the same, we, we're comfortable with them, and we become familiar with the flow in a pattern. If you want to break that flow in your pattern, you use a contrast of some sort. And all of the things we've talked about before this are, are ways that you could do contrasts. But... Um, yesterday we had that, sorry, I know that some people weren't here yesterday, so um, there was a question yesterday about the, there was a, a report that had a big number right at the bottom and um, a bunch of other visuals all over. And the question was, shouldn't that big number be top left? Because in terms of design, that is a, is a very well-known thing. You should start at top left of your page with your most important things. But actually, size is an overruling factor from, in terms of uh, ic iconic memory. So the first thing you see when you look at a visual, if you have one really big thing and then a bunch of small things, regardless of where it is on the page, you will always focus on the big thing first. And then you'll only do the sort of Z shape from the top. And that is, um, that is regardless of your reading style, whether you read it left to right, right to left, top to bottom, bottom, whatever, it doesn't matter. A, a visual, that pre-attentive attribute of size will always grab your attention before you start doing the sort of reading motion on a report. So that was actually an interesting, a little interesting thing. Um, so that contrast is a very important way to draw attention to, this is what I want you to see first, and then you delve into the rest of the details. Okay, and then the last, uh, the last thing we, we talk about in terms of visual elements or design theory is the usage of space. And um, space is, is very important, both posit what we call positive space and negative space. Um, negative space would be putting elements extremely close together uh, or, or you're not leaving big gaps between them. Positive space would be leaving big gaps. Um, and you can use that. Um, a friend of mine is a, a graphic designer or an adv uh, uh, advertising designer. And in South Africa, he, he ran a, an advert for the Apartheid Museum. And unfortunately, I couldn't find it. But it was essentially a full page in a newspaper. And in the, right in the bottom corner, in about a tiny little block, it said, until the end of apartheid, 90% of the population lived in 10% of the space. So you had this huge white page and one little thing right at the bottom corner. And it was an incredibly e effective advert and actually won a bunch of awards. Um, and uh, it was a very clever usage of space. There was no other real smart design in it. I mean, there was no nothing really else going on except this very, very clever use of white space and positioning. So um, space is a very important way for us also to convey messages. Now, I sort of touched uh, in, the, in the topics about the difference between exploratory and explanatory. And a lot of these things, when we talk about this kind of thing, when I'm saying, I want you to focus on this point, or I need you to, I want to draw your eye here, I want to do this. This only really works if I know exactly what data you're looking at. 
Because if I design a normal report where you can click and drag, the visual hierarchy may be different. So we have to keep that in mind also in terms of our design is how are we going to use this element, whatever it is that we're designing. And uh, it's, it's actually a lot easier to design something that won't change than it is to design something that actually can modify all the time. It's easier to decide on colors. It's easier to design, decide on font sizes because you know exactly what data is being displayed. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to sort of switch between things that are important in both kinds of design. And then hopefully at the end of the session, we'll sort of clarify which is which. OK. So, just quickly, this is a nice list, and uh, I will publish. The, these slides are published already on the PASS website. I am going to upload a new version because there's one or two changes, but but this slide is already there, so you don't have to take photos, but you're more than welcome to. Um, this basically just this is eight really good tips for all graphs, for all things that uh, in terms of our design, it's a uh, it's just a set of like best practices. Okay, so firstly. When you, when you have any sort of element that has time, um, always, always, always map your time left to right. Not, don't map uh, categories highest to lowest if they're by time. Don't map categories in reverse order. If people look at a graph and they know that one of the axes is time, they are assuming that it will be left to right. And if you don't do that, you are therefore forcing them to spend much more brain power than they would actually want to. So it's a much better idea to always go left, right. Yes, sir? Is, is that a function of all the places where people write? Um, that's a very good question. I believe it is. Um, I, I don't, I, 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 sorry, I, I don't actually know the answer. I would have to, I can look it up and find out. But I, I, I tell everyone, <laughs> Always go left to right. So I apologize if, if in a Hebrew or another in any other language where you go um, right, you read right to left. If time is represented that way, it may well be. I'm not sure. I, <laughs> I don't know the answer. If anyone knows the answer, feel free to shout and tell me. But no, I don't. I, I'm not sure. Sorry, but thank you. The, uh, in, sorry. Probably. Probably. Yeah, I agree. Probably it, it follows natural form, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so. Uh, that is something good to keep in mind. If, if that is the custom in the country, then, then do it that way. Don't, don't follow my advice just because I say left to right. If, if in the default there is to represent right to left, do it that way. But OK. Secondly, sorry, um, proportions. Um, any element on a graph, as far as possible, should be proportionally uh, sized to every other element on the graph. So. If, your, if a data point is twice as big as another data point, it should be twice as big on your visual as far as possible. Now, when you get to more and more data points, this is not always possible, but we should really try. And uh, the, common, the most common thing ab about this is start your axes at zero. If your axes start at zero, you are at, le in, at least in bar chance, you're, you're fulfilling this requirement that your, a bar that is twice as long will actually represent a, a, a data point that is twice as big as another element, OK? Thirdly, a legend. You only need a legend if you have multiple categories, OK? This is fairly self-explanatory. If you have a single category of data being plotted or a single series, you don't need a legend. You can explain it in a title. You can explain it in a, in a narration anywhere you are just wasting valuable real estate by putting in a legend, OK? Labeling, wherever possible, I like to label directly on the element. This is also a function of um, uh, pre-attentive attributes or how fast we can get to the data we want. If, if your data is on an axis and you have to work out what it is, you have to scan across the bar, look where it is, go down to the axis, and then get a value. If you have a value at the end, it's much easier to tell. And we'll go through an example very shortly that'll show you this. Um, simplicity. Uh, this is just, this is audience dependent. If you are designing for a normal business user, a normal consumer, use graphs, use charts, use visual uh, elements that that user or your expected audience is going to be familiar with, okay? 
don't don't come and it will don't use 3D scatter plots or um, Sankey charts or things. If you're not de designing specifically for an audience with that in mind, don't don't use them for the sake of using them. Think very closely about your visual choices. You can have 10 different bar charts on a report. It can still be an excellently designed report. There's nothing that says you can't use the same visual twice. There's nothing that says you can't reuse visuals for different, uh, for different purposes, and it will detract from your design. People understand bar charts. It's always, wherever possible, you should use them. OK, grid lines. Sorry, we have a question. Yes? So the question is, do we, do we ever take an opportunity to try and introduce new visuals when, when, uh, when building reports, when building when data? Yes, um, when, they are, when they are required, when, when there's a really good use case. So I built a report for my HR department when I used to, um, when I used to work for a company. And they wanted to know salary ranges per position. And I was really struggling to represent it on a report in a sensible way. So I went and looked up some other, uh, some other reports, and I found out that one of the best ways, obviously, to do this is a box and whisker chart. How many people have ever used a box and whisker chart before? OK. That's, that's a fair percentage. I'm, I'm well impressed. Uh, so it was a visual. Uh, a box and whisker chart basically is like a bell chart, but in for a single uh, set of values. And then you can plot, plot multiple on together so you can see you can both compare within a set of values and see the distribution and versus all the other all the other categories um, I can't go into too much detail about that just because of time but I in that case this was the best way to represent the data I couldn't find a better way to do it so it was worth the effort of my explaining to my department how it worked it I knew who the users were going to be. I had a lot of control. They knew if they had a problem, they could contact me. So in that case, yes, yeah, sure. It was, a, it was a thought out decision. I communicated the decision. We worked with it. Normally, I wouldn't do that, though. I would, I would think very carefully about it. Thank you. Good question. Um, OK. Sorry. So just go back. We, I've just moved on to grid lines. Um, fairly this is a fairly standard advice from everyone who does data visualizations. Grid lines should not be a big focal point within your data visualization. You can get rid of them entirely. If you can, get rid of them entirely. Do. If not, make them as light as possible where they're still visible, but as light as possible so that they're not detracting the attention from the main message, which is the data. OK. And now all of this that we've been talking well, a lot of what we've been talking about here is what is referred to as the data ink or the signal noise ratio. Now, basically, the data to ink ratio or the signal to noise ratio is spend as much of your ink or as much of the uh, as much of your uh, ink or the pixels on your screen dedicated to data as you possibly can. Try and limit the amount of data that is or the amount of real estate that is dedicated to other things than the amount of ink. Because all of those things are p things that people have to look at and understand. Now, just now, you may see some reports where I've got some icons and things. And that becomes a question of usability versus data to ink ratio. And we can talk about that when we get there. But this is a fairly good general principle to keep in mind. OK. And then the last one, well, I've sort of touched on consistency and use the same fonts, use the same font sizes, use the same uh, heading styles, use the same alignment. All of these things make your report, your, your artifact, whatever it is, easier to digest for a user. OK. So quickly, just based on those little eight rules that we're going to go, we're going to have a quick thing of how to make good bar charts. So we start with bar charts that look like this. Oh dear. Right? Uh, we have an awful 3D bar chart with lots of categories, and it's not very good. So we're going to try and make this better. What do we do? Firstly, we get rid of the 3D. There is no reason to use a 3D bar chart ever. OK? It's difficult to understand. If you have a third dimension, don't use a 3D bar chart. Use another 3D chart. OK? Cool. First rule of James, no 3D charts, uh, 3D bar charts ever. Good. Secondly, 
Remove backgrounds and patterns. There is no reason to have a background or pattern in this specific chart anyway. So it's already, it's already a lot easier to see, right? I haven't done much. I've taken, taken out the 3D, I've taken out the background. It's a lot easier already, right? But we're still gonna try and make it better. What are we gonna do? We're gonna order our categories. Now, this is not a time series that we're looking at. These are discrete categories. So unless they have a logical reason why they should be sorted at all times, it makes most sense for a viewer if you order them, okay? So what do I mean by unless there's a, a logical order? Well, if we're doing something in alphabetical order that like specifically relates to the alphabet, then it makes sense to order it alphabetically. But if we're just talking about categories, it's much easier, much more sensible to do it in descending or ascending order of magnitude. Right, next, I touched on this earlier, uh, that previous chart was lying. If you look at the largest and smallest value, it appears as though that, f that largest number is five times bigger than the smallest number. That is in fact incorrect. If I move it to a zero baseline, you'll see that it's not even twice as big. It's very important. This is, I, I mean, this seems like a really simple thing. It's really, really important. Tell the truth with your data, guys. Okay, secondly, or oh, secondly, about sixthly, um, it's easier to consume large, large number of categories in a um, bar chart than in a column chart, okay? So I usually, I, as, a, as a rule of thumb, five or more categories, I would usually go to, um, to a horizontal, to a bar chart. Less than that, you can choose. Um, unless you've got lots of space, and uh, this is mm, lots of considerations, but the other thing that's nice about um, bar charts is it's easier to, the, the names, it's much easier to get your names, uh, the spacing of your names. Um, and that's particularly why the, a large number of categories works, because at least you can keep your text horizontal. Um, and horizontal text is a lot easier for your brain to process than any sort of vertical or uh, slanted um, text, okay? Uh, then next one, and this is important, the, co the color before that was adding no value. There's no logical reason. There's nothing important about the color. So unless you have a reason for color, use color sparingly. That graph is neater. It's easier for you to say, this is the one I want you to focus on. It's a much more sensible thing to do. There was no real reason for me to have a legend there. Um, I assume that makes sense to everybody. You don't need a legend and a, uh, an axis. It's, it doesn't really make sense, so we didn't need that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I've removed, the, I've removed my grid lines. I've removed my axis, my, my axis uh, x-axis, and I have put all my data points um, on in line with my graphs. That graph is very, very easy to consume for anyone, regardless of basically what they do or don't know, don't know about the data, that graph is easy to consume, okay? And then the last thing is basically to use a meaningful title, and what I've done there in the title is I've also reinforced my use of color by just highlighting the category that I'm talking about in color in the title, and that's that graph is quite a lot better than that graph. Just saying, it took us a couple of minutes, we've chatted through it, and we've gone through it. Okay, so I'm not gonna do the next one in quite as much detail, because I know that there's gonna be some consternation when I show this. So how do we make good pie charts? Cool, <laughs> look at that chart. Don't you think that's amazing, guys? I mean, this is my favorite pie chart ever. So, pie charts always use, no, don't ever use 3D. Do you know what the first rule of pie charts is? Don't use 3D. <laughs> there we go, good. So thank you for, for playing into that. Um, no, three, no 3D. The second thing, what are we doing? We're removing those blow apart effects. Those blow apart effects also add very little value. You can highlight one, but it's also simple to highlight with color. So. Let's move away. Order categorically by value. Do you think that really improved my pie chart like it did with my bar chart? No, no, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. No, you're right. I've still done it because it's a good principle, but it doesn't really help at all. Which is why you should only use pie charts when you have six or fewer categories. Prathi yesterday said two. I actually, I'm inclined to agree with her in, in two. But even if we had two like that, 
I would still say avoid pie charts unless your values are very, very similar because if you see those three and you didn't know they were sorted by, uh, by order, you may not be able to tell which one of those three slices is bigger. So use data labels on the, on the elements as we did before. Use a meaningful title. This is where your pie chart becomes important. Do I really need a bar chart? No. Also no, but in teal, use a bar chart instead. That is the correct way to build a pie chart, okay? <laughs> so, uh, right. So um, I know that there are reasons. There are very good use cases, and you can occasionally use a pie chart. But please, if you use a pie chart, think about it. When you decide that it's a good idea, think about it again. <laughs> when you still decide it's a good idea, like write down a list of reasons and go and Google them and see if other people agree with you. And only then, if you find that other people are agreeing that this is a good time to use a bar chart, then I will say, okay, cool, go ahead. Otherwise, there are better ways. There are better ways for the brain to process it. There are better ways to disseminate data and there's better ways to consume data, okay? So pie charts, we've had our little rant for the moment. So let's go back. That is the end of our first section on design theory and tips. Okay, so we're now gonna move on to talk about color, okay? And uh, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on color because we, we covered quite a lot of it yesterday. But I'd like to talk about really two principles in color. The first one is called color temperatures, okay? Name me a hot color. Red. 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 Name me a blue color. I mean, a cold color. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you're wrong. It's green. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> it is, in fact, blue is the coldest color. So if we were to look at a color wheel, color wheels look like that. And you can see that red is the warmest color, blue is the coldest color. There is a nice line that doesn't really divide the circle in half. Well, it does, but not, not sort of. It's a long way from blue to red and from red to blue if you go that way around, but not so much if you go the other way around. That doesn't matter because that is basically colors. And colors, the reason I'm talking about color temperatures here is that the, the different temperature of colors actually evoke different emotions, okay? And we can use that in our design to choose, uh, to, to call to action or to convey a sense of sort of well-being, peacefulness, um, sensibility. So use lots of blues, use lots of uh, blues, purples, those kinds of neutralish, I mean, coldish colors. Uh, when you want to show that everything's going well, use warmer hotter reds and oranges and, and yellows when things need, need to be looked at, okay? So that's just a very quick thing about color temperature. And then we were talking yesterday about color palettes and how to decide, uh, how to choose color palettes and all the great tools that are available. Um, there, there are loads of tools available. It's quite easy to find color palettes online. But how do we use them in our reports? And how do we actually choose them? And there are three real ways that we can design reports in line with our color palettes. And uh, at the end, I'll sort of explain to you how, how, they, how, how we see them in Power BI, but they're very easy. But the first one is called monochromatic. So monochromatic, uh, like the birds in the background, which are flamingos, we basically are all shades of the same color. So we're basically getting darker and lighter, but within one color only. We're not, doing, we're not doing much. It's very easy to design a report that looks good using a single color. You're never ever going to jar your audience's eye. You're never going to upset anyone. And you're never going to run into any issues with color blindness. So that's, those are all great positives in terms of why you would do this, why you would use a single color in, in designing a report, single color with, with various shades. Okay, It's low contrast, simple and gentle. Um, but it's quite difficult to emphasize things, okay? Unless you can really get a very, very dark version of that color in your report, it's, uh, it's difficult. But even then, you like build up to that color. So you're still not entirely always sure that that's what the emphasis is for. So that's the only sort of downside. Um, the next color, color scheme, and this is the most common that we will see most of the time, is what we call an analogous color scheme, okay? And an analogous color scheme is where we take three colors that are next to each other on the color wheel, and we make them 
our, our base colors, okay? And that color, that uh, this is what we talk about when we talk about the 60, 30, 10 rule. You choose one color, that's your base color. You do most of your coloring in that color. 30% is your highlighting, and then 10% is some sort of a real accent that needs to be really called out. That is how we would use uh, an analogous color scheme, okay? It's a, a very flowing color scheme. The things move into each other very nicely, like a monochromatic. It has medium contrast. Obviously, we no longer have only one color. We have multiple colors. Um, and it can be used, if you're, if you're a, a really good designer, and I don't count myself in that category, uh, but if you're a really good designer, people can use this analogous color scheme to lead users on a path of how they want them to follow a report or a graphic or whatever it is. So if, we, if you really study hard and you understand all of that sort of nuance, you can do that. But because of that, because it's quite tricky, it's slightly less intuitive to build a good report like this, and you are likely to make it a little bit jarring at first until you understand exactly how to use this color scheme. But it's nice to know that it exists, and like I said, this the, the, the common way to use this is our dominant supporting and accent color 60, 30, 10. Okay. And then the final color scheme that is really common is what we call a complementary color scheme. And how does a complementary color scheme work? Well, basically, we take one color and we take the color directly opposite it on the color wheel. We have a complementary color scheme. And essentially, what happens with a complementary color scheme is that you use, a monoch uh, you use the monochromatic, but you use your secondary color or your opposite complementary color for highlighting. So it's a nice way to design. So a lot of the time, what actually happens is we end up using these three kinds of schemes together. Sorry, let me just go through the, the details if anyone wants that picture. Complementary color schemes are very vibrant. It's very easy to highlight data because of the high contrast, but it can be very, very overwhelming because of the fact that you're using colors that are so far apart on the color wheel. So this must be used with care, okay? But what I was saying before is, what we often find now in, in our, specifically in Power BI, but in any office tool, if you think about it, is that if you look at your color scheme, you probably have four or five analogous colors along the top, and then you have a complementary color that we can use for highlighting. And each one of those colors, if you look down, you have various shades and tints of that color, which is our monochromatic thing. So, Power BI offers any of those, well, any tool basically makes it very easy for you to decide on how you want to mix and match with these three schemes to make them work together. So you may have on a graph, I want to use a monochromatic, so I just want to go lightest to darkest, I want to shade, that's perfect. This is a great way to design um, bar charts. But overall, your whole report is using an analogous with a complementary color for highlighting. So it is a nice way to know that the, these things are, are basically built into the tools for us. Um, so hopefully, if you, haven't, if you haven't seen this before or noticed it before, you've just got a, a very basic idea of uh, colors and, and the themes and how we can use them. I'm going to sit down for a second, and we're going to go in, into uh, Internet Explorer or some other related browser, um, and we are going to quickly go and make this full screen. That's what I was looking for, sorry. Uh, so, oh, sorry, good good catch, thank you. Um, what do I do, Windows P, duplicate. Uh, and now I have to go back to where I was. That's better, cool, sorry about that, thank you. Um, so. So I just want to talk quickly about this uh, report. Uh, in fact, it's not that report at all. Um, I've opened up the wrong screen. So here I have a report that I kind of uh, designed rather haphazardly. And then I thought, I'm sure I can make this slightly better by using, um, by using different colors. So here is basically the same report, but using a monochromatic color theme. I've got couple of variations of that teal, light bluey, uh, greeny blue color, whatever it's called. Um, and I've just used that. You can see that where I tried to highlight something, it is, it is there, but it's not super visible. It's not really, really pre-attentive. It's not pulling our attention. Um, but 
it works pretty well. I didn't really have to think about this. You don't go, geez, James, what did you do at the top there? Or what did you do in the middle there? Like, I basically just made it lighter and darker, and, and it kind of works, OK? From there, we can make it, give it a little bit more contrast now. We move into to our analogous color palette, exactly the same report, OK? And now it's pretty much in that theme popularity visual. It's a lot easier to see what I'm trying to highlight. Um, and everything else kind of works, but there's a lot of color in there. It's maybe it's used not very sensibly, but just showing the, the different feel. You can feel it's a little bit more vibrant, a little bit more grabby, it gets you in there, and it, it's sort of, um, it's a little bit, little bit more exciting. And then the last one, which is uh, the complementary, um, you can see here, it's really, really easy to see what I'm trying to get you to focus on. Like, those three, those three data points uh, across the report are really, really the first things you see. And then from there, you, you can explore. So that's the same, the same report three times, just with slightly different color um, themes and how it changes the feel of the report without actually changing any functionality or anything else going on there. So I'm going to go back to this guy. Um, question, yes? Yes, uh, you, you were talking about data heat ratio. Yeah. Can I ask you, to, sorry, the question was, there are a lot of icons on that report that you've just seen. Uh, is it for functionality or is it for decoration? Can I ask you to hold, because we're going to go back to that report at the end of the next section, and then you will see what we, why, those, why those icons are actually there. So, um, but yes, uh, it's a very good question. And sometimes I have designed reports that have pictures on them just for fun. So I, I can't say that I, I'm totally not guilty of this crime. But in this case, we are going to see what those things are there for just now, and, and hopefully they will explain. Right. So we've gone through color now. We've gone through our, um, we've gone through our general design theory. I'm going to spend maybe two minutes talking to you about grid theory. How many of you have ever designed a web page? Oh, quite a chunk. That's cool. How many of you read up about grid theory before designing a web page? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> a couple. OK, so basically, uh, there is a web standard called 960.gs, which is the implementation of grid theory in web design. Um, and it's fairly standard and common amongst most people who are, who are designing. So essentially, as an example, I'm just quickly going to show you. This is a dice that I built in a die that I built in PowerPoint. OK. And it's, uh, it's really just a bunch of dots arranged in a grid in a block. But the thing about di dice are they always look neat. OK. And they always look neat because the dots are arranged in a block. If they were in like weird haphazard shapes and that, you probably wouldn't it probably wouldn't look quite as cohesive to the brain, and it also wouldn't be as easy to understand exactly what it is you're looking at all the time. Mm -hmm. So have you ever played, has anyone ever played with a D9 or a D1632, any of these? Funny? So they're slightly more difficult. They're not as intuitive as a, as a six-piece player dice, just because there is no differentiating factor, but it's only the number on the actual side of the dice that lands that you can look at, and it takes longer to see what you've done. Whereas everyone, you roll a, a three, a five, a six, everyone just recognizes that pattern and uh, picks it up immediately. So as that, uh, that is kind of the inspiration behind using grid theory and grid design, okay? So essentially, I'm just gonna quickly show you what I mean is here is a grid, okay? This is a three by three grid. It's not very exciting, but in any way, I can f if I fill up that grid in any way, it always looks fairly good to the eye. So here's a couple of examples, okay? So I've got obviously one very big block, one slightly smaller block, and three small blocks. Here I've got, I've got it the other way around. Here I've got a totally different arrangement. All of these arrangements, I've completely gone edge to edge of one part of the grid, and I filled it up, 
And all of these patterns look cohesive in our mind. They make sense because they've got clean lines and they've got sort of well-defined boundaries, okay? But they're quite overwhelming. If you look at full solid shapes like that, they're really like whoo, in your face. So what grid theory advocates for is actually putting grid, uh, what they call gutters, between your shapes on, in your grids. So you basically go, that, this is that same three by three grid, except that now I've put gutters on top, I've put gutters in between um, and uh, in, in both directions. And now when I put those same shapes like that, Okay, obviously we don't, we don't, we're not going to have these little uh, gutter lines. They're just guidelines to show you what was happening before. But those shapes, it's, it's just a little bit more breathing space. It's just a little bit more space for us to sort of take it in. Okay, so it's easier for me to kind of show you this on, on, a, on an actual report. And uh, we're going to go back to that same report that I just sort of was looking at. I've just got to work out which tab to go to. This one here. So... Here I've got a blank report, okay? So in the same way that I just built that grid in my, uh, X, in my PowerPoint, I'm gonna now put a little grid on my, on my report. Can you all see that? Yes, you can see the, the grid, okay? So I've put a grid in there. Now I'm gonna add some elements to my, to my um, report. And I've added those elements currently without any, um, without any gutters or without any breaks between them. And you can see that that report is quite likes right in your face. It's very, very oppressive, okay? So what instead I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of follow my own example, and I'm going to put in some grid lines, some gutters, and then I'm going to put the exact same elements back, but just with slight spaces between them. And you can see here that now there is quite a lot of there's quite a lot of breathing room. It's easy to tell that the top line is all connected. You've got your, your big visuals in the bottom. So it's not really groundbreaking, this, you know. I mean, we all know that all the tools give us grid guidelines to help us put things, align things, and put them in this. But I actually literally, a lot of the time when I design my Power BI reports, I use the actual pixels, the, the, the actual... Um, X and Y coordinates, and just make sure that my elements are positioned exactly the way I want to. I have a, a Power BI reports by default are 16 by 9, 1,280 characters by 720. If you divide that into nice 80 by 80 blocks, you will get 60, 16 by 9, which makes it quite easy to work along. Uh, and uh, essentially what I do there is I start with a 5-pixel five, um, five gutter uh, on either side. Um, and then you just, so if I want to put a visual somewhere near the, the middle of the page, it's like 565 by 325. Put it in there, boom, puts it in the middle, and that's where I go. And then you can put all your elements around it like that. And you really get, without knowing a lot of, without being an artist, you can design things that look relatively good just by using this grid theory and this grid layout in everything you do. Um, as I said, there's a blog post. I'll, I'll share the link with you at the end. There's a whole big article about this. really interesting if you, if you want to read it and if you have a little bit more to go to. OK. So those are our two very quick demos. I have 27 minutes to go, which should be just about perfect. So. As I said there, no thought design. That's basically how I think about it. It's like, OK, cool. The other thing it, it does, sorry, I, I, I wanted to say this. The other thing that grid theory does is it basically forces you to go, my visuals will be at least this big, at least this high, at le and I won't try and squash three visuals into the space that, that I've actually allocated for two, because I know that my visuals must be 70, minimum of 70 pixels high, minimum of 150 pixels wide. You know, so I have this nice, I have this nice little guideline, and it also stops me from doing exactly that, like shave 20 pixels here, shave 20 pixels there, then everything's out of line, and stick to the grid works beautifully. Okay, right, so let's move on. We're going to touch on something that may be a little bit strange or maybe you weren't necessarily expecting. But I really love this quote on this slide. Um, and uh, it's part of why we're going to talk about it. But we're also going to talk about um, how accessible design helps everybody. So the one argument for accessibility that doesn't get made nearly enough is how extraordinarily better it makes some people's lives. 
How many opportunities do we have in our day-to-day -day jobs to make someone's life better? And that's really, like, it's a profound thing to think about. Like, it's really small. It really doesn't take a lot of time to add, make your Power BI reports, your whatever it is that you're designing. It doesn't take a lot of time to make them accessible to everyone. But it is something that can really make a difference. So what is accessibility? Well, basically, accessibility is designing products that are as usable by as many people as possible without you having to change anything. Okay. So when we first design, we think about that, and we think, how many people can use our report? Okay. So we don't just design for someone who can read, you know, can read a dot on a wall at 100 meters. Because, sure, maybe our report looks great for that person, but the other 99% of the world can't see that. So, you know, we're going to think about that. But why are we talking about accessibility in a design session? Well, at the end of the day, accessible design is good design. If you design with accessibility in mind, you will find that you are employing good design principles and you are making good design choices because you're thinking of the accessibility of your reports. And we're going to look at, uh, well, an example of this is what they know, what is called the curb cut effect. So I think it was in about the 1970s or something, um, the city of New York uh, created those diagonal slopes on their curbs, on the corners, for wheelchair users. Okay? And it was done because of pressure from the, from the, the wheelchair lobbies and the various um, disabled associations and that. But what they found was that within three years, it was those, those curbs, were, those uh, cut curbs were actually making a difference for a huge number of people. They were helping out women with prams. They were, they were helping out people who were walking on, maybe on crutches or who had walking sticks, people who had injuries and couldn't lift their legs very high, people who were riding bicycles. They found that actually this design that was put in place for, uh, to, to solve a specific uh, problem with, with mobility actually helped a huge number of people. And similarly, um, we have uh, closed captioning or, or subtitles in movies. Um, a lot of people, obviously, uh, this, this was put in to help people uh, with uh, hearing deficiencies. Um, and, uh, but it's, Netflix say that I think something like 30% of people watch shows with, um, with subtitles on. Because sometimes you can't understand accents. Sometimes you can't hear because maybe the production, you're in a busy room, you're in a bar. I was in, I was in Buffalo Wild Wings the other day watching uh, football. And they had um, closed captioning of the commentary, which I've never seen before. That's, that was brand new for me. Um, and it was really interesting because I could watch two different channels at the same time and see the commentary on both. So like these kinds of things that were actually uh, accessibility designs have become very mainstream and they really make everyone's life, uh, can make everyone's life easier. The last example here is, is actually straws. Now I know that currently there's sort of a big environmental debate around straws, but actually straws were designed for people who were suffering from um, quadriplegia, who, who weren't able to pick up drinks and, and move them to their mouths or people, and, and they've become such an ingrained part of our normal sort of day-to-day -day life that we wouldn't think of them as something that was des uh, were designed for accessibility. They were designed for ease of use, really, if you think about it. So all of these things are examples of why des accessible design is good design. It has much far, well, far reaching impacts than you can, than you can imagine. Much further reaching impacts than you can imagine. Sorry, brain failing. Um, so, so this is why I've sort of touched on it in this session. Now, I have in the slides in the slide deck there are twenty odd hidden slides about accessibility, which you can go and read for yourself. And they have a lot more detail about what we're talking about, what various things we can do. But we don't have time to go into all of that. So, the four things that we really think about in terms of accessibility are visual oral, cognitive, uh, motor, and cognitive impairments. So basically, those are the four things we're thinking about. Now, I'm not going to go into what is all of those things. And, and obviously, visual is our most common. Visual is the one that we see most often. Uh, color blindness, low vision, all those kinds of things. But 
we can keep all four of these things in mind um, when we're designing. So if you're interested in this, uh, here's, a, here's the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, this is a series of standards and documents that explain all about accessible design, all the things that we can keep in mind, all of the various um, things we should try and do in our design. And what I really like about this, about this document is that for every design that they, or for every accessibility issue that they talk about, there is an actionable point. Like, for when designing, make sure your contrast ratio is at least 4 to 4.5 to 1. So that is, the, there's a key measurable metric. You can say, I have done this, I now know I'm, I'm compliant. I have done this, I now know I am compliant. So, and it's really cool to have that actual checklist. But the checklist is pretty, fairly comprehensive. It's about an 85-page document. So maybe that's a little bit much for us. So um, we're, we're lucky because in our community, um, I'm going to skip through the slide and I'll come back to it. In our community, we have Megan Longoria, who is really big on accessibility. And she's, she writes incredibly insightful articles. And, she, and she's really great for this kind of thing. And she has developed the PBI, the Power BI uh, accessibility checklist. So this, which I can show you, is a, a sort of watered down version of the, um, a watered down version of that document. Here you can see this is what it looks like. Basically it gives us a set of instructions, you know, ensure color contrasts are this. Avoid, avoid using color here. Check your report page works well for deficiencies, do blah, blah, blah. So there's a whole list of things here that, that Megan has written down and actually blogged, and this gets updated. And um, there are various references and blogs inside here. In fact, one of Prathi's blogs is, is referenced from within this document, and I'm going to show you why in a second, um, about how we use it and how we make things more accessible. Um, so uh, this is a really good place to start. It's, it's, it's a two-page document rather than the 80 pages. And it, it also has actionable points. Do this, do this, make sure this works. So it's a really good place to go. Um, so let's go back to the, to the slides quickly. And I'm going to go back through that slide quickly. Um, so the question that I asked on this slide basically is, can you achieve every single standard? And the answer is yes, you can. Should you? Well, that depends. Because actually, there is a huge, there, there becomes quite an investment in, in designing with accessibility in mind. And some of the, some of the things on that checklist may be um, not relevant for reporting particularly, and for the type of work we're doing. So it does depend, um, you know, s some of the things there are like when you did designing for people with cognitive, uh, with cognitive um, uh, deficiencies, you have to make sure that you don't uh, use phrases that may be confusing. You, may, you don't use jargon, you don't use this kind of thing. When you're designing for a set of business users, if you use jargon, that is not a problem because that business user knows what you're talking about. So, you know, this is where I say it depends. You've got to consider these things, but at least you can, if you've made a decision and go, no, actually, my target audience, this is okay, cool, here we go. So, this is a quick list. This is uh, sort of taken from Megan's uh, blog, but this is my own little thoughts of what we should do. Um, and this, I find, is quite useful to do on all reports. So the first thing is universal legibility. So make sure that everyone can see your reports, regardless of any sorts of vision impairments. Okay, and uh, and that includes people who are wholly um, who are wholly blind, and they uh, and that's why we talk about alt text and um, and uh, navigable uh, keyboard navigable, so you can have a screen reader. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Okay. Secondly, for for hearing impairments. Um, this is just, there's only really one thing that we can talk about here is turning off autoplay um, because of the fact that uh, you can have serious re adverse reactions to loud sudden noises or sudden noises that start. So people should always be able to choose when they start um, playing noise and or, and or video, okay? 
This one here, I, I just sort of touched on it, but simplicity is sophistication. So explain acronyms that may be confusing, replace, replace jargon if you can, and remove distractions. Removing distractions is quite a, a, a good one, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about get, lightening grid lines and getting rid of um, noise and minimizing our ink. And then finally, uh, for people who maybe ca can't use, um, who can't use a mouse, consider your keyboard navigability of your reports. So what do we do there? The, really, all we have to do there is make sure that the tab order is correct because Power BI is a fully accessible product. And uh, in fact, if you design with your tab order in mind, someone who uses a, screen, uh, a keyboard navigation can actually, um, can actually do it themselves within Power BI. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and show you a little demo I built where you can see some of these things. I think it's in this one. So let's go back here. So here's a very simple report that I built. It's got a bunch of things going on here. And um, somebody give me a very typical female name, please. Angela, that's a good name. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type in, oops, not James Angela. Angela, and put it into my report. Okay, and here I have a report. Okay, now the first thing you've noticed is that I'm using color to indicate something on this report. Now, let's, we're not going to get into discussion on gender stereotypes here. Um, that has, the, the only reason I've used blue and pink here is because they are universally a pre-attentive attribute that says people know that if they see pink, they're talk, we're talking about women. If they see blue, they're talking about men. Hopefully in time that will change. I think it is already changing, and maybe I shouldn't be the person who's building things that reinforce it, but that is actually, you know, it's a, it's when you use, if I were to use blue and red in terms of American voters, that would also be a similar thing. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about a known construct, that known signal that we can use. Okay, so here I've, I've built this report, and I just want to talk through a couple of the, um, the sort of decisions I've made here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually switch on my screen reader, which means I have to go like that. Narrator heading level one. Welcome cool. to Narrator. This is storytelling with data, Power BI, Google Chrome pane, table list of names to filter report, grid, table list of names to filter report. So did you know that Power BI did that? Yeah. Who was there? Chris, anyone else know? Did, has anyone ever has anyone ever tested this out, played around with a screen reader? Um, it's it's really quite cool. Now I, I'm going to put, preface this with a disclaimer. I'm not very good at navigating <laughs> um, using a keyboard, whatever. But uh, it is Alert. Name. it is Angela. You see, I've chosen Angela, and my report is updated. Name. Um, so now you can go out of this uh, specific, let me go into a different Total place just birds there. And you can see now that I can navigate entirely births. using my in keyboard. Year of maximum annual births. And overall uh, ranking card, you overall can, popularity ranking for the selected name. Overall ranking card, overall popularity ranking for the selected name. So the next question is why, what is, how is, um, how is Power BI knowing what to read out here? What is it doing? So first, sorry, let's say, so the first thing is, did you see that that all tabbed in a logical order? Okay, so I have gone and set the tab order within that report very deliberately to make sure that if someone were navigating this report, they could navigate in the order that they would expect to do it. So that was a conscious design decision. But then the next thing I've done is that within the reports themselves, I've actually, I've actually, um, given alt text to every single visual and every single element on this report. So you can actually go onto any element and it'll explain what it is, okay? And then I've added a couple of other little accessibility things here to make it easier. So you can see we've got this little visual that shows female sign 99.9%, okay? What does that mean, okay? It's not very clear. There's no real extraction here. Haha, <laughs> I didn't upload a new version. Okay. Anyway, you can bookmark button. I built in More a bookmark information that about the visual explains button. what that does. Will's looking at me funny because he knows there's a better way that I should have done this. Um, <laughs> but um, which actually it's worth me showing you, so I will do that. But I 
I previously built this in before, before the, the new feature was available so that if somebody didn't understand what was going on on this report, they could click on that button and would it, it would explain to them the calculation that was behind this specific visual because it's the only thing that's really slightly confusing on the report. Everything else is relatively self-explanatory. So it's the one thing that I thought needed some additional bookmark, bookmark um, button. thing. More okay, I'm going to switch off the screen narrator. reader now. Um, but let's go, let me quickly go into Power BI itself uh, and see if I can find that report because had I uploaded a new version of this report, you would have seen that Power BI actually have built in a um, have built in their own functionality to do exactly what I had to do with bookmarks there, which is in fact using um, this is this screen here, which is in fact using that uh, visual header tooltip. You can actually just hover over it, and it'll bring back exactly the same thing. Okay, and that's the blog that Prathy wrote that uh, um, that Megan re uh, referenced in her blog post is how you can use these um, visual header tooltips uh, in various ways to improve your reports. Okay, so that's another thing that we can be aware of. Um, so in terms of accessibility, I think it's very important to, to, keep, uh, to keep our audience in mind. And our audience have varying needs, and it's always good to design it's always good to be pre, uh, to preempt any problems rather than to get a call back someday that said, hey, you know, this person can't use my report because you didn't use the right colors. Hey, this person can't use the report because they got low vision and your contrasts are terrible. You know, it's much better to preemptively check the stuff, get it doing, and to do it as you build the report is fairly quick. To do it entirely at the end is quite slow. So it takes quite a long time. So I would suggest that if you can, keep this kind of thing in mind. Right, we have not very long to go, which is good, which is okay, because these two sections are very short and we're gonna go into much, most, most of the detail for these two sections in tomorrow's session where we actually build data stories. Um, but let's just talk quickly about data exploration, okay, and you can see those are all the slides I have for data exploration because I thought it would be easier for us to actually go into a report and quickly talk about the decisions that were made rather than talking about um, exploratory report, that one. Cool. So here I have, you're gonna have to just let it load slowly, there's one, there's one slightly thing here. What I did here was I was looking at a data set and we'll play with this data set a lot tomorrow, but I have a data set of all the names given to children in America since 1910, okay, based on social security numbers or social security cards, the applications. I got this data, it's an open source data set. I got it and I built a bunch of data stories from it, okay? But one that I was interested in, which is not really a data story so much as this is an exploratory thing, was names that have sort of changed between being male names and female names or that are very neutral, that can be both male and female at the, uh, in the same time, and how those have evolved over the years, what kind of thing we see. So what I did here was I just built a little report. There's not a lot going on here, but it basically shows how many babies were born with one of these names that I've identified as a sex neutral name. It's about 14 million. How many names uh, there actually were that foot, fall into my category. And then there's a list of them, and then there's a, t a graph that we're gonna play and show the time axis. So this is a cool little, when you wanna show how various things are moving against each other, I, I really like this visual. Um, I use it occasionally. It's very chaotic with so many data points. I wouldn't usually use it with so many data points, but I've kept it like this so that I can highlight a data point and, and show it uh, as it goes. So this is a pretty cool name. You can see that there, there are names that go, that stay quite heavily male and then have like two years as a female name and then come back. There's some names that basically uh, were male names up until 1940s and then they've changed to female names, never changed again. Um, like the name Lauren of, of, is a very strange one for me. I saw that there was a, 
Lauren was almost exclusively a male name up until the 1940s. And then something happened, and then it became a female name. It's never changed again. It's like 100% female ever since then. So we've got a lot of things going on here. But as we play around with various, uh, as the, the design, sorry, the design decisions that I made in this report, and there's a couple of things here, is that one, I leveraged the pre-attentive attribute that I talked about earlier in terms of using colors that everyone is familiar with. Because I don't have to explain which side of the graph is female and which side is male. I do, because, I, but it's, it's fairly, it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, the secondly, I've got, this, I've got this graph up here at the top, okay? And if you click on a specific name, so let's choose, uh, let me, did I have Lauren? There's Lauren. So if I choose Lauren, you can see it does exactly what I said, okay? Now, if we pop it out, you can see that it was a very unpopular name uh, before 1940, but it was, it was a blue name. And then it became a pink name ever since that point onwards. Um, and there are, there are different names. Uh, Kerry is, a, is another example. Let me just find Kerry quickly. Uh, shout if you see it. There it is. Kerry. That's, a very, in, that's very interesting for me. Um, OK? That, as a name, it's, it sort of has fluctuated over time. It used to be very strongly associated with males, then very strongly associated with females, and now it's gone back to being quite strongly associated with males in, in the last couple of years. So I don't know what's precipitated these changes. I don't really know what's going on there, but I thought these were interesting. But there was one name that I could explain, and this is the data story I'm going to tell you right now, and that's where we're going to end for today. And that is the name Angel. Cool. So I found that name Angel in the thing, and I wasn't really thinking about it. And I thought, wow, that's a really, I'm, I'm surprised to see it being a sex neutral name. I would have thought that if someone was named Angel, they would have been a female. Like, I, I, was, I was convinced. And then I thought about it a little bit, and I realized what was actually going on. And I thought I'd build a data story about it. So firstly, I've shown some some things here. The firstly, I'd just like to show how popular that name is over time and, and how it's changed, and the total number of people. And you can see that actually it's very strongly male overall. Okay, And then I plotted it against a map, because that for me was the interesting thing. And you can see that it's quite strongly male in certain states and quite strongly female in other states. And my geography, my US geography wasn't that great. But I had a guess as to what I thought was going on. And I went and pulled some other data. And I went to Wikipedia, and I downloaded the Hispanic-speaking population of all states in America. And I built a map of that. And I laid it underneath the, it's the same map of, of this. And it's uncanny how closely they resemble each other. It's actually quite, it's quite interesting how, how similar they are to each other. And then that told me the story I wanted to know, was that whether if a child is born with the name A-N-G-E-L, whether they are male or female is very strongly dependent on what state they are born in. But it's not, it actually doesn't have anything to do with the state. It has to do with whether they're Spanish or English speaking. And um, that, for me, I was a, it was a cool little experiment. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, I, I thought it's, an, it's a nice little way to end the, the session today. And this is the kind of thing we will be looking at tomorrow. I'm not going to talk through too many of the design, um, design patterns and things that I did here. I think uh, it's fairly self-explanatory. There's only four visuals on it. So there's not a lot going on. But I thought this was a nice way to sort of introduce the concept of data storytelling and what we do and how we get to the process. We start, we find data. We identify points, we come up with a hypothesis, we try and prove it, and then we build a story. And that's exactly what I've done here, and that is partially what, well, this is a lot of what we're going to do tomorrow, and uh, we're going to go into a lot more depth in terms of actually uh, data storytelling, building stories, playing around with data, and, and bringing out that kind of insights. So let's go back here. And... Um, that's, that's all from me, really. I'm not going to go through. You can. There's exactly one point there that we don't have to really talking about. We've talked about all of that. So this is basically, we've talked about all of those, those, 
first, the three with the ticks, choosing visuals, cleaning up visuals, leveraging our pre-attentive attributes. So tomorrow we'll talk about understanding context and telling a story. Yes, sir. Um, that is a great question. Can I, can I finish? And yeah. let me just quickly sign off, and then we will come back, because I just want to leave this, my, my show on the, on the um, slide that has, don't have to worry about any of that. We're going to talk about all of that tomorrow. Um, so that, at the bottom of that slide, you can see there is a bit.ly link. That is the blog post I've been talking about. So there, is a lot of, there are a lot of links. There are a lot of references inside that blog post. You can find out quite a lot about everything we talked about today. Um, tomorrow, the, we, will, we will go into a lot more detail in terms of data storytelling, building data, or data journalism, and, and how to design for known data. Um, so I hope that some of you are interested enough to come back for that. Um, but if not, thank you very much for coming today. I, I really hope you learned something. And um, I hope you have a lovely time for the rest of your past summit. Go now, and then I'll, ask, I'll answer questions while I pack up. Thank you.